For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Your key to financial opportunity. God's country. In 1903, early businessman Ira Thompson was credited with the first automobile in Thomas County. 1908, Henry Ford produced a reasonably priced, reliable, and efficient Model T. Before 1910, few automobiles were on the road. However, once car fever began, almost every issue of the Colby Free Press carried news stories about some prominent citizens purchasing a new automobile. On one occasion, the paper headlined that John Acker drove the 20 miles from Brewster to Colby in 45 minutes flat at a rate of almost 27 miles an hour, as this was considered high-speed traveling at the time. It was in the years just before the entrance of World War I that a road-building hyper-enthusiasm spread across the country as Thomas County businessmen played an active part in attempting to get good roads throughout not only Thomas County, but all of northwestern Kansas. During the 1920s, there was a lot of road construction that the war had delayed, and the Federal Bureau of Highways was planning a major transcontinental highway system from coast to coast across the United States. 1925, Colby businessmen hoped that one of the proposed routes, US-40 and US-24, would come through town. After many state and national meetings were held, early in 1926, a decision was reached in Colby's favor. By 1929, all the Thomas County earth roads were improved and graded, but it was long before Dwight D. Eisenhower became president that he realized the importance of highways. His first realization of the value of highways occurred in 1919 when he participated in the U.S. Army's first transcontinental motor convoy from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco. On the way west, the convoy experienced a series of mechanical difficulties. Vehicles got stuck in the mud or fell through wooden bridges. After 62 days on the road, the convoy finally reached San Francisco. By the late 1930s, the pressure to construct transcontinental superhighways was building in Washington. Franklin D. Roosevelt repeatedly expressed interest in the construction of a network of toll superhighways as a way of providing more jobs for people who were out of work during World War II. General Eisenhower saw the advantages of the Autobahn Highway Network and the enhanced mobility of the Allies when they entered Germany, an experience that shaped Eisenhower's views on highways. Interstate 70 was formed when President Eisenhower signed the Federal Aid Highway Act on June 29, 1956. The bill laid out the proposed route from Kansas City to Topeka to Oakley to Colby, which would involve US-40 and then US-24 to the Colorado Line. In 1962, a Colby Free Press article reported that official state traffic projections indicated that by 1975, the average daily traffic on the portion of Interstate I-70 across Thomas County would be about 8,000 vehicles per day and would connect Thomas County citizens with important cities such as Kansas City, Topeka, Denver, and St. Louis. On December 18, 1965, I-70 opened for traffic at Colby. The dedication was held on December 17, 1965. 
In sub-freezing weather, Governor William Avery assisted Miss Maisner, a 101-year-old resident of Colby, in cutting the combine belt that spanned the highway. Miss Maisner came to Thomas County with her parents in a covered wagon in 1885 from Mount Pleasant, Iowa. Today, an average of 10,000 cars a day travel I-70 past Colby, with an estimated income from tourism in Colby at almost 14 million. On Valentine's Day, 1985, nearly a dozen statements were written by troopers on Kansas Highway Patrol stationery with the subject headline, Homicide Investigation. Of the statements forwarded to Colonel Burt Cantwell at the Kansas Highway Patrol headquarters in Topeka, Kansas, the first read, On the afternoon of February 13, at approximately 1545 hours, I was working on I-70 near Levant Interchange. The Thomas County Undersheriff, Ben Albright, was looking for a subject from Brewster and asked if I would watch eastbound traffic on the interstate. He was working a county road. I overheard radio traffic from Oakley reference a shooting at Stuckey's restaurant at Grainfield. They were advising the manager had been shot. They didn't have any other information at this time. I started eastbound on I-70 from Levant with about a fourth of a tank of fuel. I heard Oakley advise that they had units en route to Grainfield. I was almost at Colby when I stopped at Phillips 66 just north of the Colby interchange for fuel. I was at the station putting fuel in the patrol car and watching traffic on I-70. I observed an older car with a blue front end and a red rear end. It appeared that someone had changed the complete front end. At this time, I thought it was a 1970 model Pontiac two-door hardtop. I started east on I-70 and overheard the Thomas County Undersheriff, Ben Albright, checking on an abandoned car at Levant on I-70. A dispatcher advised him a tow truck was in request on the vehicle. I knew where the undersheriff was. I advised him I observed a 1970 model red and blue Pontiac westbound on I-70. I advised Ben to check this car if he saw it. It should be in the Levant area at this time. I was about three miles east of Colby, eastbound, when I overheard the undersheriff run the tag with the Colby PD. I traveled about two more miles when I heard undersheriff Ben Albright say on the radio that he was shot and to get him some help. I turned around and headed west and advised on the radio of what information I had referencing the officer shot in the vehicle description. I was about two miles from the Levant interchange when I overheard Colby PD advise that there was a shooting at the Levant elevator. I overheard the undersheriff in his car about halfway down the westbound exit ramp at milepost 46, Levant Interchange. I checked and Albright was sitting in the driver's seat. He advised he was hit in the chest and right arm. I asked if he knew how many were in the vehicle. He stated four to five. A Colby ambulance arrived shortly after I did. Albright looked at me and said, go get him, I'm all right. I went to the Levant Elevator, which is about a mile and a half north of the Levant Interchange. There's a small building to the west of the drive, which is the office and scale house. To the east of the drive is a concrete grain elevator. As I pulled in, I could see the front window of the scale house was broken out, and the older red and blue car was sitting facing north between the office and the elevator with the passenger door open. There were several people in the yard who advised me that there was a victim on the floor in the office. I went to the office and checked one older male subject who advised he was shot in the back. He was lying on the floor and having a hard time breathing. There was a female there taking care of him. I went back to the car and called for an ambulance. Colby advised that they had one en route and should be about halfway there. I was advised by several people in the front yard that the suspects left in the 1978 Green Ford Super Cab pickup. I heard a Colby police officer advise that a vehicle matching the description of the suspect vehicle was northbound on the county road, four miles west of Colby, which would be about five miles east of my location. The ambulance arrived. They advised they could handle the problem at the location. I started north from Levant on a county blacktop road. I overheard Colby police officer Randy Jones advise that he had a double homicide four miles west and two miles north of Colby. Randy Jones advised the vehicle was still northbound on K-25. I crossed over into Rawlings County and overheard traffic that the vehicles were now south on K-25. A few minutes later, they advised the vehicle had pulled into a farm and there were shots being fired. I turned east on a county road and came out on K-25 just south of the farm location. I was about two miles away when I heard they had three suspects in custody and one shot. When I pulled up, there were several officers checking the farmyard. 
About 10 minutes after I arrived, I and several other officers moved vehicles to one side of the highway to get traffic moving again. Traffic had been stopped about a mile in both directions from the farm's location. Officer Darling had a female suspect in handcuffs and placed her in his patrol car. He asked if I would stay with her so I could help get information. She had a gunshot wound to her left hip. While sitting in the car, she did a lot of shouting and crying. I was trying to ask her something and she wouldn't talk. She stated once that she didn't think this was fair as she was being held at gunpoint and she finally got away from them and now she was being treated this way instead of receiving help. I asked her her name and she wouldn't answer. I asked where she was from and she stated that she was told to remain silent by the other officer. Earlier, I observed Officer Darlene read her her Miranda rights. I explained to her that she did not have to remain silent unless she wanted to. She stated that they had all gone to college together in Michigan, and all of them were from there except the one suspect, and she didn't know where he was from. She complained of being shot in the hip, right leg, arm, neck, and in the head, but the only visible injury was of the hip. Signed, Dwayne A. Bogner, Trooper. Approximately 8 miles north of Rawlings County line, I observed a vehicle matching the description southbound on K-25. The Ford pickup was closely following two southbound semi-tractors. Approximately one half mile behind me was Colby PD Officer Mark Ebert. Shortly behind Ebert was Colby PD Officer Dennis Brown and Colby PD Reserve Officer Butch Dibble in a privately owned station wagon. I radioed back that the vehicle was coming towards them. I made a U-turn and advised that I was in pursuit of the vehicle. The pickup was passing the two semis on the left. As I was passing the first semi, I saw the pickup tick off the shoulder for a farmhouse six miles north of the county line. The pickup stopped just short of a propane tank north of the house facing southwest. North of the propane tank was a large metal building. I pulled partially into the farm's drive, slightly south of the pickup. Officer Ebert stopped behind me on the edge of the roadway facing south. The right front passenger in the pickup left the vehicle and ran west between the propane tank and the metal building. The driver of the pickup got out of the driver's door, left it open, and started running south towards the front of the pickup. At the front of the pickup, the driver turned and fired shots from a revolver. One shot struck the lower right corner of the windshield of my patrol unit as I was stepping out. The bullet was later found lodged in the headliner near the rear window. The other shot struck the front door of Officer Ebert's car, breaking out the window. The driver then ran around the pickup and took cover on the passenger side. I fired six shots from the right rear corner of my patrol car, reloaded, fired six more, and reloaded it again. By this time, the shooting had stopped. Shortly thereafter, I could see Officer Brown working his way south along the east side of the metal building. Brown was aiming a shotgun toward the passenger side of the truck and yelled at someone to come away from the vehicle. A white female stepped away from the truck and walked about 10 steps before falling and yelling that she was hurt. Brown then motioned for Ebert and me to move toward the truck. He went around to the front and I went around to the rear of the truck and covered the two white males who were lying face down in the snow. Both were injured, one fatally. The passenger who ran around the metal building was captured unharmed on the north side of the building. I radioed that all four suspects were in custody, one dead, and that an ambulance and a patrol supervisor were needed. By this time, Agent John Kite of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation and Rawlings County Sheriff Jones had arrived and taken control of the scene. Signed, Mark A. Convoy, Trooper. At about 15.30, I was ending my shift. At about 15.50, I received a phone call at my house from Colby Police Dispatcher Mary Messamore saying there had been a homicide at the Stuckey's restaurant in Grainfield. They had no vehicle or suspect information. I put a uniform on and went back to work and started east on I-70. At about 16.09, Under Sheriff Ben Albright advised that he had been shot and needed help. A state dispatcher advised that Trooper Mark Convoy was in chase with a suspect vehicle south on K-25 at about mile post 218. I started north on K-25 and heard that they had pulled into a farm and shots had been fired. When I arrived at the location, the Bud Roche Farm, I pulled my patrol car behind Convoy's unit in the farm's drive. Directly north of the pickup, a white female was sitting on the ground. Looking underneath the pickup, there appeared to be a person lying dead. Also, Dennis Brown of the Colby Police Department was north of the suspect vehicle and motioned us forward to the pickup. I approached the female, patted her down, and placed her in handcuffs. 
she stated that she was hit in the left arm and hip. I escorted her to my patrol car and advised her of her Miranda rights against self-incrimination. I placed her in my patrol car and did not ask her any questions. Trooper Dwayne Bogner stayed with the female. I started taking pictures of the scene after all the suspects were arrested. All of the tracks, empty shell casings, vehicles, etc. photographed. After all the suspects were arrested and transported, a search for weapons was conducted. We started our search on the north side of the metal storage building, walking in a line of three to four feet apart. Approximately seven to eight feet northeast, in the northwest corner, Griffins observed a pistol, appearing to be a semi-automatic, lying in the snow with the barrel pointed in a westerly direction. The weapons were photographed by me, and measurements were taken. It was removed, marked as evidence by Sheriff Larry Jones, and a further search did not reveal any other weapons. Signed, R. Darling, Trooper. The next day, a 357 Magnum revolver was found in the snow a short distance forward of where the pickup had come to rest. A check on the 1971 Osmobile with the Michigan registration 296COK, which is half blue at the front and red in the rear, revealed the owner is 18-year-old Mark Anthony Walter of Sutton's Bay, Michigan. Signed Jerry K. Dietz, Lieutenant. I took a position on the south perimeter of the farmstead so as to observe the south and west sides of the farm. I was advised I needed to get around to the back of the house in order to block any attempted escape in that direction. At this time, radio traffic indicated that there were now three suspects being taken into custody and one dead suspect at the scene. I immediately returned to the residence to assist securing the prisoners. After this was done, I began working on a diagram of the scene. Signed, Kevin L. Winston, Trooper. As we arrived on the scene, I observed a highway patrol unit half extended across the southbound lane of traffic. Behind the highway patrol unit was a trooper moving south from the trunk of the patrol car. I observed another officer moving along some trees on the north edge of the farmstead and eventually along the east wall of a large building. I observed another officer moving in a clockwise direction around the front of the home. I parked crossways on the road facing west about 100 yards south so we could cover the backyard area of the house and watch if anyone started running across any fields. When I noticed the scene was contained and all the subjects were in custody, I observed Trooper Darlene escorting a young female toward his vehicle in handcuffs. The female appeared to be faint during this process, but she immediately came to shortly thereafter. I later rode with the injured female to a Colby hospital in a Colby ambulance for security reasons. During this time, I detected a strong odor of an alcoholic beverage on the injured girl's breath. I also noticed that she had injuries to her right arm and one buttock. She told me that she was shot earlier, accidentally, by one of the suspects with a 22 caliber pistol. Signed, Terry D. Blosser, Trooper. At 16.45 hours, Trooper Mark Convoy was northbound on Highway 25, north of Colby, when he met the suspects who were at the time driving a stolen pickup, he turned around and gave pursuit. When the suspects realized the police were converging on the area, they then turned into the farmyard of Bud Roche. As they turned off K-25 with enough speed, they jumped the ditch and went across the highway, heading diagonally across the yard leading to the farmstead. The jump quite possibly caused the pickup's engine to die. The pickup then coasted to a stop. Trooper Convoy turned into the second driveway. As he stopped, the driver of the pickup got out of the pickup and fired two shots. One hit Convoy's windshield. Convoy retreated to the rear of the patrol car, where he fired a total of 12 rounds from his service revolver. When the shooting ended, one suspect was dead and two others were wounded. I recommend Trooper Convoy be presented with the Superintendent Award for performing in a highly merited manner, under conditions where his personal safety was greatly jeopardized through the actions of others. Trooper Convoy was aware of the previous shootings the individuals had just been involved in and knew they would be shooting at him at the first opportunity. His fire surely prevented the suspect from taking cover in any nearby buildings, which would have greatly complicated matters. I feel Convoy's coolness and judgment in the face of great adversity exceeds the criteria set forth for this award. Signed, Melvin M. Wedemeyer, Captain. As Thomas County Attorney Perry Murray was considering filing charges of first-degree murder and attempted murder against all three suspects, along with possibly charging them with kidnapping and auto theft, 
Colby Police, several sheriff's offices, and the Kansas Bureau of Investigation continued to piece together evidence on the shootings. However, several questions remained unanswered. It had not been determined who had fired two of the guns used in the shootings. And it wasn't clear how a violent convicted criminal got together with two teenagers who had no history of trouble. Who was the hitchhiker, and what role did this Vietnam veteran, described by the press as a ruthless drunk, play in these executions? As headlines of the Kansas killings rolled out across the nation that spoke of bloodthirsty bandits instilling a sense of deja vu deep in their guts, a meaningful connection to other recent crimes began to formulate beyond the borders of Kansas alone. In so many words, an execution-style crime spree. As detectives nationwide awaited ballistic tests and the results of the search of the suspect's car, final investigative decisions were on the cusp of being made. For instance, Crawford County, Arkansas authorities had found 22 caliber shells at the scene of a convenience store robbery that left clerk Linda Marvin with six mortal gunshot wounds lying face down in a pool of her own blood. Meanwhile, Crawford County Sheriff Traylon Ball, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Joey Self, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney David Saxon, and Investigator Don Taylor had already made the diligent decision to travel to Kansas to interview the three surviving suspects, James Hunter, 33, Daniel Rometta, 27, and Lisa Dunn, only 18 years of age. Act 2. Interior Colby Jail Interview Room Day The four Arkansas authorities who have just arrived in Colby enter an interview room where Lisa Dunn awaits after having been released from the hospital where she was treated for gunshot wounds. She is already seated in a chair as the four others settle in. The interview begins as a recording device is turned on and an Arkansas investigator by the name of Don Taylor says, Before talking with you, I'm going to advise you of your rights. This will be a taped interview with Lisa Dunn Today's date is Friday, February 15th, 1984. Correction, 1985. It's now 1.22 p.m. Present during the interview are Sheriff Traylon Ball, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Joey Self, DPA David Saxon, Investigator Don Taylor, and Lisa Dunn. Lisa, do you understand your rights as I've explained them to you? Yes. Okay, Lisa, do you know when you came out of Texas, do you know what route you took? Um, to Texas? Um, through Louisiana. You went over through Shreveport, is that it? Uh-huh. And up into Arkansas? Yeah. You came to Texarkana from Shreveport? No. We went over to the little town. Um, I think Dixie Inn and took a highway that went off. Do you think you could look at the map here, an Arkansas map, and show me? Really, I don't know. It doesn't have Dixie Inn on here. I don't, I don't, I, I think it was seven. Highway 7, something 7, one of those highways going up that came from Dixie Inn. Okay, you came on up. Did you hit Interstate 30? I wasn't sure of that. I just said it. Possibly I was sleeping. Do you know if you went to Little Rock? I don't remember Little Rock. I thought I must be sleeping or something because I don't remember even seeing the signs for it. Okay, Little Rock is a pretty good sized town and you don't know. Yeah, I know. Did you get on the interstate anywhere? I tried to figure that out last night, I'm not sure. Well, now you can also go up through Texarkana and Highway 71. We didn't hit Texarkana, I know that, because I remember Spring Hill for some reason, seeing a sign for Spring Hill. Okay, you think you then come on up through Magnolia and up this way? Um, Magnolia doesn't sound familiar. Um, Amps? No, Hope does, though. But I don't know how we would have hit that. Where? Well, I know we came up 7 here. It made it cross to... I'm not sure. Oh, you know you came out on 7. I, I, that sounds so familiar. Springfield, coming across Springfield, coming in. Okay, that wouldn't have been any problem to come up and hit Hope. See, and then you could have hit the interstate and come into the Little Rock. Do you remember going through Conway, Morrillton, Russellville? I don't remember any of those names. That's why I just... Clarksville? Hot Springs? No, Hot Springs is in Kansas, isn't it? Arkansas? Oh, I thought it was in Texas. I thought it was in Colorado. What about Glenwood? Where's Glenwood at? Right here. No. I know how we... I mean, I really don't remember any of that. You don't remember whether you were on a four-lane highway or... The last two weeks, about four or two and other, I couldn't remember the day, what kind... I'm just not sure. Okay, let me, um, let me describe a location. Probably the easiest way would be to draw you a picture. On Interstate 40 between Van Buren, Arkansas, and Little Rock, there is an exit at the 20-mile marker. This is the interstate here. 
You get off, there is a DX service station sits here. There is another service station sits across the road with a little cafe. You come down here and there is a stop sign in Highway 64. Right here is a Jim's Grocery and Gas. It sits kind of facing kind of a catty corner to the highway here, to this highway. There are some gas pumps that sit right here. Do you recall pulling in and there was a Cadillac parked here, putting some air in the back tires and pulling in right here and there wasn't room to get through and you were driving? I just don't recall me ever driving or anything. I keep going over and over and I remember so many things, but I don't remember stopping in Arkansas. That's what I told the first time. I I rarely ever drove. I don't see how I, I... The only time I remember driving was in Mississippi. Mississippi. That's the only time the whole trip of the two weeks that they even let me drive. Because they were both so tense. I'm, I'm not trying to lie. I know they have my description and everything else. But I, I just don't remember that place or anything. At any time, you said you remember going through Fort Smith, I believe. I said they told me I went through Fort Smith. That's what I said. The only thing I said is that Mark told me I went through Fort Smith. You know Mark got killed. Oh, okay. But you don't recall going through there. Don't recall any, just recognizing names, because everyone's heard of Fort Smith. I just thought it was in Texas. And you know, Little Rock, I recall the name, but I... But you don't know if you went through there or not. I really don't remember. I just, I saw the pictures on TV and all, and I just, I tried to... Were you taking any drugs? No, I was drinking beer. Drinking beer. The only drugs that we had were like no-dos to keep awake. Okay, you had the pistol, though. When you left Texas, the twenty-two pistol... Yeah, because it was at Shreveport, Louisiana that they got it. They got it in Shreveport? Uh Uh-huh. Did they buy some shells for it there also? No, they went down the road and had someone else buy it for them. Do you know what kind of shells they were? For the what? For the twenty-two. I don't know the difference between the shells at all. Deputy Prosecuting Attorney David Saxon. Do you know the brand? I didn't see the box. I just know they were little gold ones. That's all. I, I don't know what the shells were or the guns... Did you buy shells more than once? No. You only bought the shells one time. Don Taylor. Who bought the gun? I think, yeah, it was Mark. I think it's Mark. That's what Danny told me. Because I was over buying books. There was like five books in the car. I was over buying at this flea market. And they were in there by themselves. Danny told me that Mark was the one that purchased it. I'm not sure. I can't really tell you because I wasn't right in there with them. David Saxon. Where in Shreveport did you buy it? It was a flea market. Where? Do you know where? What highway is it on? It was right off... Okay, you know the highway that goes right through Shreveport? The interstate or just the highway? The interstate. 10? The big one. I'd have to see a map. It's the big one. And it's between the Texas line and the main part of Shreveport. And I think it was the side you see then, because there was just... You go off and exit, and there's a big yellow sign that says flea market. It was yellow and black. Okay. I went in there, and I went around and bought a few things, and that's when they purchased that. And I didn't see who bought it. That's why I don't know. But Danny said Mark bought it, so I assume Mark did, because he was the one carrying it out of there. Don Taylor. Okay, but you're quite sure that you didn't drive anywhere in Arkansas. I don't ever remember driving in Arkansas, no. I remember driving specifically in Mississippi, but they didn't let me drive very much because I'm not a good driver, and I just never, I've never driven very much. But they did let me in Mississippi. David Saxon, did you stop anywhere that you knew you were in Arkansas? Stop the car any place. Um, one place I remember stopping in Arkansas was right after we crossed the line, and we stopped and asked how far it was to Arkansas, and they told us we'd already been in Arkansas. He said, you've been in it for the last five miles, and I think we stopped a little while later, about an hour later, to get gas somewhere. Do you know where you were? It was some real little town with just one little gas pump in some place we were laughing at weird name of a food store that was that was there we just got some food there and got on the road and they ate and then that's why i can't see why i would have could have driven in arkansas because i remember falling asleep as soon as we bought the food i remember i ate and then fell asleep in the back seat were you in oklahoma when ever during this two-week period yeah do you remember being in oklahoma after you left arkansas i think you have to go through oklahoma after you hit arkansas i think we got a hotel there i'm not positive though You said you knew you were in Arkansas when you stopped and got something to eat. Yeah. Do you remember the next time that you woke up and knew where you were? Were you in Oklahoma? Were you in Arkansas? Were you someplace else? I don't remember. It's just all so boggled. I'm not not sure. Did you stop someplace in Kansas besides here? Yeah, Wichita. How long? When did you stop in Wichita? Jeez, it was about 1, 1 
Yesterday, day before, today's Friday. Um, what? I, it would have been, yeah, Wednesday. No, Tuesday we stopped. Tuesday, okay. And where did you stop before you got there? What was the last place you remember before you got to Wichita? Uh, I guess gas stations and food stores. Do you know where? What state they were in? Um, no, I'm sorry, I, I really can't. In Oklahoma, I remember taking a turn. Isn't the Muscogee Turnpike in Oklahoma? Uh-huh, the Muscogee Turnpike is in Oklahoma. Did you come through Tulsa? No, we, uh, okay, uh, in Arkansas. Okay, before we went on the Muscogee Turnpike, we stayed at a hotel because we were there. We were there across from a truck stop. There was a little motel. We stayed there and got up real early and left there. Don Taylor. What was the name of the hotel, motel? I wasn't sure of that, but I know it was across from the truck stop that had fried chicken steaks. I remember we got some of that. David Saxon. Does Green Country Motel sound familiar? Green Country? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I can picture the place perfectly. Well, tell us about it. What does it look like? Because out front, they had two Coke machines. And as you go through the door, because I, I wanted, I was up late in the night because I had to pay a phone bill. And there was two ladies working there. I think it was a light brown type interior. Was it a wood building? A brick building? I think it was brick. Red? What color was it? I'm not sure. Does the name Sally Saw ring any bells? I didn't check it. I, I, didn't, look at, I, I didn't look at the sign. It's a town. Oh, it's a town. Yeah, Sil Sally. Yeah, Sally Saw. I'm not sure. Muldrow? I don't know the town. I just know we stopped at a motel, but I'm sure they I'm sure they can find out because I think I got some slips in the car or some matchbooks. Would this be Monday night? Because you were in Wichita Tuesday. We were in Wichita Tuesday afternoon. It would have been Monday night then. Then as far as you know, you'd gone up 40, this, this place. You say it wasn't too far off Interstate 40 Monday night. Then... I wouldn't say, sir. You keep asking me the same questions. Did you take I-40 till you got to the Muscogee Turnpike? Uh, 40? Those highways are so confused. Which one's 40? I-40 going to Oklahoma. Were you on I-40 when you were in Oklahoma? Um, I, I'm not. Those 20s, 30s, 40s, I, I could just see a map. I might. Could I check? Were those highways you were on before you got to the Muscogee Turnpike? Was it a four-line divided highway like an interstate? Yeah, I think so. It wasn't a two-way or two-lane state road. No, it was a divided one-way that turned on to the Muscogee Turnpike, and then we paid twice because there was like two parts of them. Uh-huh, okay. And then you say you did not come through Tulsa, or you did come through Tulsa. I don't think... Isn't Tulsa in the middle of the state? Well, the Muscogee Turnpike runs into Tulsa. Oh, well, we took the one that went like that. I remember seeing it on the map, and it went like that. We didn't take the one that went through Tulsa. We went the one that went up and hit, I think, Missouri first. We had to backtrack over to Kansas, because I remember trying to get directions. Uh, the Will Rogers Turnpike. What? The Will Rogers Turnpike. Yeah. So you were on two turnpikes, Muscogee and the Will Rogers. I thought they were only one at first, but I remember seeing a Will Rogers sign, so that would have been the second part of it. So you were on... I just know it went in a V, like, so you were on the Muscogee Turnpike and you paid two tolls there. Well, I think I only paid one there, and I, I think the other one must have been the Will Rogers one. I just remember paying two tolls. Okay, let me show you. Here is the Turnpike. Right, we took it. Where did you stay from the turn where you took? We must have gone through Tulsa because there's just no other way, huh? Where did you stay f someplace between the state line and there? Um, okay. There's a Muldrow. I wouldn't know the name of the town. The motel there is the Interstate Motel. Does it have a truck stop across the street? All I know is across a little street, there's just a little street like where the exit runs. Uh-huh. There's a truck stop across from it, a pretty good sized one. They had a bunch of cattle and stuff there, and it had a restaurant hooked to it, and a big... Where? Where? Over there in Sally Saw's got one. So does Roland. Deputy Prosecuting Attorney, Joey Self. Uh-huh. Roland's got one. The Big D. Lisa. But with the hotel across the street? But the truck stop was across from the motel, right? Not across the highway, just a little street. Okay, so they were side by side. They are across from each other, but it wasn't the big highway, you know? Okay. Now what I'm asking you is, you came off the interstate, and then whatever street you were on, was it on the opposite side of the street from the motel, or was it side by side, and there was a street that ran between the motel? It was a street that ran between them after we took the exit, because I think the street they're on ran parallel with the main highway. Don Taylor. Was there a traffic light there? I don't know, I just remember seeing... Do you remember what time, Lisa, that you got to the motel? I don't know, because I was... I had been sleeping. Okay, who checked into the motel? Mark did. 
Did you use his name, or do you know? He never tells me anything. I couldn't tell you. Because I know we went in, and it was really quite early, and Danny and I both were in bed. Well, I was asleep anyway. And then I woke up later on, and Mark wasn't there. And Danny said he was out getting chicken. Quite early, what do you mean? What? Well, I woke up a couple hours later. I don't know what time it was. It was really... I just remember I woke up once, and Mark was gone. I woke up again and ate, and then went back to sleep, and then we left. How many people were with you in Louisiana? Louisiana? Uh Uh-huh. When you stopped at the flea market to buy the gun. Oh, three? Three. Who were they? Me, Mark Walter, and Danny Rometta. When you stopped in Arkansas and got something to eat, how many were with you? You mean after we crossed the border? Just three. Same three. Yeah. Okay, when you got to Oklahoma and you spent the night at the motel. Same three. Same three. Danny and I never had the car other than when Mark did. Mark usually did all the driving. It was only for relief that maybe Danny would drive. Rarely that they let me. Don Taylor. Did Mark sleep part of the time while you were driving? Yeah, but he usually insisted on sitting up in the front and sleeping. Because he didn't like the back seat. He'd make me sit back there. He hated the back seat because he liked to be able to see what was going on, he said. Because it was his car. David Saxon. Where do you all get that car? It's Mark's. From Michigan? I never asked him where he got it from. Don Taylor. Where did you get with him? With Mark? Yeah. In Florida. In Florida. David Saxon. What were you doing in Florida? Oh, well, that's where we live. You and Mark. Me and Danny. Not Mark. David Saxon. Did you go to Missouri? Yeah, I remember stopping in Missouri. Do you know where? At a little gas station to ask why we were in Missouri and not Kansas. Because we thought we were going toward Kansas. Do you know what town you were in? Um, does Joplin, does that sound familiar? Will Rogers Turnpike, I think, picks up there, doesn't it? I remember we had to backtrack to get to... Did you go through Baxter Springs and then to Kansas? Um, yeah, we did, because I I knew we stopped and asked directions to get to Wichita and spend the night. I think that was earlier that... It was either that or Independence we stopped, because I remember both of those. David Saxon. Before you stopped at the hotel for the evening, you said you stopped in Oklahoma. Do you remember stopping just shortly before that? Within an hour or 30 minutes before that? Uh Uh-huh. Were you asleep when they stopped, pulled into the motel? Yeah, I was in the back seat then. I was asleep. So that's when I asked Mark if we were at a rest area or something because I had to go to the bathroom. So we got a motel room and we stopped. So has your physical appearance changed any since you were in Arkansas? Yeah, I darkened. I, I had brown hair. Real dark? Pretty. I think pretty dark. How about the other two people who were with you? Describe them. Mark's about six foot, I'd say. Pretty skinny. Brown hair. How long? Short? I don't know. Just a little long. Never combed. It's always a mess. Was it below his ears? Was it long? Oh, in the back, yeah, it was. What about the sides? This part was a little bit below his ears, too. It was just always a mess. Did he part it at all? If it was parted, it was down the middle, right down the middle. And who was this? That's Mark. Mark. Mark Walters. Walter. Who? Walter. Mark Walter. Mark Walters. Walter. Who? Walter, I guess. Walter, okay. And where do you pick him up? Florida. Florida. And that's his car. Yeah. And the other boy? Danny, he's got a dark brown hair, also almost black, because when we were at the motel, he did make it black, but I couldn't tell the difference. It's it's almost black. He dyed his hair at the motel. Yeah. The one in Oklahoma? Yeah. uh, No, not in Oklahoma. In Kansas City, in Wichita. It was two nights ago or three nights ago. And his is usually, it's just combed back, because that's the way he combs his hair, his back like that. It's receding a little bit, right? Just, Just barely. David Saxon. Did you all stop any place, like when you stopped in Oklahoma? Did you clean your car out, take all the trash out and throw it away, or... I don't know. We clean the car out every once in a while, you know? When you travel, it gets dirty. I couldn't tell you where. I mean, we probably just stopped at a store. Don Taylor. Did either one of them smoke cigars? Cigars? Yeah, you didn't see any time either one of them smoking a cigar? A cigar? No, not at all. You don't, as far as being in Arkansas, you don't know how you came into Arkansas other than you came in through Shreveport. You don't know where you came through. No, from Dixian, I'm not sure. Sheriff Trelon Ball. Is that the name of the town? Yeah, Dixian was the name of the town. Yeah, and there was a highway that went north. At first I thought it was something like 167, but it must not have been, because there's not any of those numbers there. Don Taylor. How much money did y'all have when you came into Arkansas? I couldn't even tell you. How much did you get down in Texas at that when you robbed that surface station down there? I think about 300 is what I figured last time. When did you start running out of money? 
I would say because we still had money left, and I would say that we never ran out. I would say at all, because we only got, after we left Louisiana, the next place that we spent a lot of money would have been the motel. There's no we went through a couple hundred before that. So, because we still had plenty of money at the Arkansas, um, Oklahoma hotel, because I remember getting chicken and stuff. How often did you have to stop to get gas for your car? Oh, geez, not very. I, I don't know. It took... It took a long time. We made it across the whole state without getting gas. I'm not sure how many miles to get gas miles. I'd say it was a couple hundred at least miles before we stopped. I'm not sure. Do you remember, I've asked you this once, but you're quite certain that you don't recall driving anywhere in Arkansas, and especially where I'm talking about pulling into this place and changing drivers. No, because I I don't normally drive, and even when I was in Mississippi, I never pulled into any place. Just switch drivers. Like, if I had to switch, would stop right on the highway and switch because I didn't want to go into public places because I didn't have a license. Lisa, how many guns did y'all have? Um, just the two. Sheriff Trailer and Ball. The 22 and the 357. Uh-huh. Okay, who was carrying the 22 after you bought it? Well, right after Mark was carrying it, and I don't know if why he carried it. That was mainly his. Danny had the 357. The 22 was mainly his because he was the one who wanted it so bad. Who what? Mark was the one who wanted it so bad because Danny had the 357. Mark was the one who was always playing with it, loading it up and stuff, and Danny didn't know how to work it because I remember that. The first time he went to get bullets for it, he got the wrong kind and Mark yelled at him. I can't tell you who had what, when. I wasn't watching half the time. A lot of times it would be under the seat. Don Taylor. Did you ever have one? Uh Uh-uh. You never did go into the store anywhere with them with a gun. Uh Uh-uh. I never carried a gun. I never, I hated them. I was always yelling at them when they had them in the car because I like to keep them in the trunk because I hated them. Now, Danny, you're pretty serious about Danny. About what? Him. You have strong feelings for Danny. Yeah. Okay, you wouldn't sit there and tell me something just because you have strong feelings covering for him. No, you can even ask him. Mark always loved the 22. i I'm not lying about that. And he always carried it. And Mark never did carry the 357. I can't say that either, because Mark did sometimes too. I never saw Danny carrying the 22. Where did you see it in his hand? Like in the car when he was looking at it, trying to figure out how to put the bullets in? Because Danny didn't know how to. And just, a lot of times, he didn't let me know where it was, seriously. It was underneath the seat or something. Sheriff Traylon Ball. Prior to, or any time that you were in Arkansas, you didn't see anyone killed or anyone robbed? No. Joey Self. Did you hear them talking about, or the other two talking about doing anything while you were asleep? They don't talk much about a lot of stuff when I was around. Danny knew how I felt about it, probably. All I wanted to do was go to Colorado, and have Mark go on his own way and live. Don Taylor. And he didn't talk to you at all after, after, they just, he he knew I'd probably, he knew I got upset a lot of times. Traylon Ball. Where did y'all first start getting your money from the stores and service stations in Florida? In Michigan. In Michigan. You all got your money. You robbed the place up there before you moved to Florida. Yeah. Now, who was Danny and another guy named Tom? Named what? Tom. David Saxon. Anybody killed there? No, no one injured at all. Don Taylor. What kind of vehicle did you all have then? A different kind. It was a big... It it was a brown... It was brown and blue. It was Tom's car. We used Tom's then. I didn't know that much about it. All I wanted to do was get out. I didn't want to know anything about anything. I just know they didn't hurt anybody, because they had been told I'd be gone if they ever did. Did y'all change cars from the time y'all started out in Texas to the time that you got up here? From Texas? From Texas to here. No. You always drove the same car. Yeah. Don Taylor. Put a little extra paint on it, didn't you? Yeah. Where did you do that? Mark took that to a, up to a, it was a junker type, garage type place where you fix cars and stuff. And he did it. Just, he was going to paint the whole thing, but he ran out of paint. He didn't let me or Danny touch it because he said that we didn't know what we were doing. His job didn't look too hot either, though. Mark did it then. Yeah, it was his car, so he didn't want us touching it. He said we didn't know what we were doing. Traylon, you got any other questions? Traylon Ball. Did you, uh, do you remember stopping and anybody getting robbed in Mississippi that you know of? No, definitely not, because that's when I was driving. Okay, how about in Louisiana? No, we just stayed there for a few days. How about Oklahoma? No, I don't remember robbing any people in Arkansas either. Lisa, let me ask you something here. You said that Mark, that was his gun, and that you had that gun, but you know that it was his. I was just... Okay, but I believe that when y'all were arrested up here, 
I believe you took J.C. Hunter with you. I don't know. After I got shot, I don't know who got what. Gone what way. I just... I got shot before he got... Before he got way before them. The police officer was... I don't know who switched guns when... I think they might have switched guns when they did that robbery or something. I don't know what their workings were. Well, Lisa, to this weapon that's out there, we're going to take and run ballistics on our ammunition we've got. And we feel that they're going to be the same. Now, you still say that you've never stopped anywhere in Arkansas and you didn't see anyone robbed in Arkansas just before you went across the line into Oklahoma. No, I explained. People have been asking me about Arkansas ever since I've been here. I've told them everything I know about everything, but I don't remember anything about Arkansas. I was completely truthful with them in all the questions, but they're... But their people keep saying I did this, but I don't remember any of it. Traylon Ball, what are you charged with here? Who knows? I don't know. They haven't told me anything. I, I don't know what's going on. Don Taylor, I need to get some photos of her if you're through. Traylon Ball, I think that's all. Don Taylor, Lisa, if you'll just stand up right here next to the wall. David Saxon, do you want me to turn the tape off? Interior, Colby City Jail Cell. Daniel Rometta, who himself had previously been released from the hospital, surviving a critical condition from a severe gunshot wound to the upper rear thigh, is sitting in a 6 by 8 foot cell in a baggy jail-issued jumpsuit. With as fine and legible pinship as possible, he carefully drafts a statement. People's Exhibit 1. The said is strictly only to the FBI. If different people use it, it's done by force. I, Daniel Eugene Remetta, age 27, hereby swear to be in a good state of mind, wish to strive to save an innocent young lady of the charges in the state of Kansas by solving 11 counts of murder and approximately 9 armed robberies, which I possibly will confess to, if she can be assisted in the said, not to be punished drastically due to the fact that she had no knowledge of the crimes which took place in Kansas. This also would save the court's time and money. I could not confess to this madness which occurred here due to the fact I neither had knowledge what would take place here, yet I was there and asked for nothing for myself. I only desire to protect an innocent girl who comes from a good family. The crimes I will confess to doesn't mean I was the murderer, but possibly involved, which is the same as far as the law is concerned. Bodies also could be recovered as well as the caliber of bullet used. At the bottom of the single page of lined paper, in a loose cursive, I, Daniel Rometta, turn the said statement over to the special agent in belief the said will help Lisa Dunn, who wasn't involved, which is known to be true beyond doubt. I expect nothing in return for myself. Signed, Daniel Rometta, February 16th, 1985. Interior, Daylight Donut Shop, Colby morning. Over coffee and donuts, a group of early rising machinists and farming folks holding their own kangaroo court share their perspectives on the killings. They could have held the trial right there at the farmhouse. They shouldn't bring them to trial. The arresting officers should have gone for them when they had them in that pickup. Others who are equally enraged sitting about the table talk of capital punishment. As this is about the same time that state legislators in Topeka are debating reviving the death penalty in Kansas. It's a hell of a deal, said the owner of a one-room pool hall in downtown Colby. The sons of bitches will probably get off without serving anything. Murders mean nothing anymore. Three years, five years. We need capital punishment back real bad. Interior. Citizens Medical Center waiting room. Colby. Day. Friends and relatives in a hospital waiting room, where both Maurice Christie and Under Sheriff Ben Albright are being treated, have to say this about how the suspects should be served justice. I'll say you take off running, and I'll shoot you twice. And if you keep running, I'll shoot you in the head, just like you did those two hostages. The main feeling right here is that the lawmakers need to get that damn capital punishment bill passed. I called State Senator Richard Gannon to tell him that his phones have been ringing off the hook all day with people telling him the same damn thing. Exterior, Bud Roche Farmstead. Afternoon. Shattered windshield glass still litters the snow where the shootout occurred. Though bloody patches of snow have been plowed away, a woman who lives just down the road from the farm watches as her son plays with the toy gun at the shooting scene. Today is not a good day to talk about gun control, she says. 
Interior, Moore Residence, Colby, evening. As Melba Moore sits in her simple pine floored living room, talking to a reporter from the Wichita Eagle, wondering how something so senseless could have happened, and how somebody could kill her husband Glenn, she exclaims, I'm mad. I want to throw something. I want to hit something. It's useless, she says. You know this is supposed to happen in the big city. It's not supposed to happen in the boondocks. This is God's country. Interior, Jim's Place Tavern, Colby, late night. As friends, family, and acquaintances of the Colby victims gather to commiserate at a tavern only a few blocks from slain victim Glenn Moore's home, a bartender holding court says, I just think they ought to shoot those guys. They never gave them one chance, so why should they get any different? As the tavern mumbles and murmurs and occasional shouts of fury, anger mounts toward the outsiders who had come up the I-70 sewer pipe like filthy rats and tainted the pure white prairie with the blood of their very own. And a bottomless hunger for vigilante justice begins to snowball out of control. Interior courtroom, two years after the killings. On the stand sits the Thomas County Sheriff. Speaking, Mr. Fooch. Sheriff, let's talk a little bit about your jail. There has been an allegation that the atmosphere in your jail basically was coercive. I would like to have you address your comments to the type of facility that you have and the atmosphere surrounding the incarceration of Mr. Rimetta, beginning on the 13th of February, 1985, and ending with his transfer from your facility, I believe in the early morning hours of the 16th of February, 1985. Can you tell me, sir, when you first came to be housed in your jail? Speaking is the sheriff. Sir, it would have been the evening of February the 13th, as I recall. You have indicated that your department consists of approximately seven full-time deputy sheriffs. For clarification, seven full-time people, actually, but only four road officers. The other three people? They're either jailers or clerical people. How many jailers do you have? I have two now, sir. At the time, February 13, only one. What was his name? Kenneth Messimore. Do you recall the time of day or night Mr. Rimetta was initially housed in your facility? It was in the, as I recall, in the later evening hours of February 13th, sir. And was Mr. Messimore on duty at that time? I believe so, yes. Did he at that time carry a weapon? Mr. Messimore? Yes. No, sir, he did not. What type of security did you provide at your facility on that date and on later days? Well, certainly we had some additional police and sheriff personnel in the building at the time. As so far as additional jailers, since I had none, we had to provide them through deputy sheriffs and police officers. But you did securely keep the defendant in your custody. Yes, sir, I did. And you did interpose your agency and the Colby Police Department officers between the defendant and the public at large. Correct, sir. In other words, the public. Attorney Mr. Springstead objects. Judge, he's leading the witness. I would object. Mr. Fooch. Well, for purposes of this hearing, Your Honor, I think I could speed things up a little bit if I'm allowed a little bit of latitude. Well, to a little bit of latitude, I'm objecting now. You're beginning to testify for the witness. The court. Finish your question, if you would. Mr. Fooch, could you tell me whether or not the citizenry of Colby, Kansas, were afforded access to Mr. Rimetta in your jail? Sheriff. No, sir, they were not. Who was allowed to visit him during the time when he was there between the 13th and the 16th of February? Only police officers or deputy sheriffs or the jailers. Did he speak with any attorneys as far as you know? I don't believe so, sir. I don't believe he was appointed an attorney until several days after he was confined in jail, sir. Of your knowledge, do you know whether he requested an attorney be appointed for him at any time between the 13th of February and the 16th of February? Not to my knowledge. Now, there came a time when he was moved from your facility. Correct, sir. Can you relate for us, please, the circumstance of that move? I had already made arrangements, sir, for the transfer of all three individuals from my jail. At a particular time, as earlier in my testimony, I indicated, we can only hold 11 people on a full-time basis. At the time that they were housed in my jail, I couldn't give specifically how many people I had. It was eight or nine. We were basically full at that time. So I had made provisions with the sheriff of Ellis County, Hayes being its county seat, to transfer and hold three individuals in his jail. Earlier in the evening, prior to them being moved, the dispatcher received an anonymous phone call. Prank in nature, if you will. Something about the fact of stampeding the jail, if you will, and removing three individuals. Was one of them Mr. Rometta? That's correct, sir. That was a taped conversation over the phone system. One of the dispatchers on duty was able to recognize the voice. During the span of time that they were working on that, 
I did call some additional police officers and sheriff's officers to the sheriff's department for the purpose of securing and made provisions to transfer them. When you say them, who were you referring to? Mr. Rometta, Lisa Dunn, and James Hunter. Do you recall what time this, you characterize it as a prank call came in? As I recall, it was midnight or after, sir. About the time the bars close. Yes, sir. To your knowledge, was Mr. Rometta aware of the existence of this phone call? No, sir. While he was in your facility? No, sir, he was not. It was in the middle of the night? Correct, sir. What time was he moved? They were moved separately, as I recall, from approximately 3.30 a.m. to approximately 5 or 5.30 a.m. Mr. Fooch, your witness. Attorney Mr. Springstead is speaking. Sheriff Jones, how are you doing? Fine, sir. Good. You indicated that my client came into your jail the 13th of February, 1985. Is that correct? Yes, as I recall, it was the evening hours. Now you indicated, I believe, you classified this call as what you would say a prank call came in. Is that correct? Correct, sir. But you took the call seriously enough to add additional officers to your staff that night to call them in as additional security, did you not? Sir, I had to take it in some serious note. I think I would be aloof as a law enforcement officer not to have. True or false, Sheriff? There are people in Kansas that would be capable of doing something like that, stampeding the jail. Not to my knowledge. It's never happened, sir, in the 17 years that I have been there. Well, that's not what I'm asking you. I didn't ask you if it happened. I said, are there people out there that might be capable of doing something like that? I'm sure that's a possibility. I mean, we're the people. The people were angry about this incident out there, weren't they? I'm sure somewhere. They were outraged in your community by what happened. I would classify them more as shocked. You would not say they were outraged, angry at my client? I'm sure there were some that were angry. You had some people express that anger to you, didn't you? Sure. So there was anger in the community. Some yes. And there was hostility in the community. Some yes. In that atmosphere, you got this phone call and you called in additional security. Yes, sir, I did. In fact, you put people on the roof of the jail, didn't you? I did not order them up there. I think some themselves went up there. They went up to the top of the jail and they were armed. Correct, sir. And how were they armed? I'm sure they had their sidearms and possibly a rifle or shotgun. And how many went up on the roof? Sir, I do not know. Approximately? Two or three, I guess. It was determined that you all could not continue to operate at that manned level. Isn't that true? No, sir. I wouldn't answer that question in that particular light. But then my client was moved. Correct, sir. He was. That same night? Correct. Under the cloak of darkness? Correct. He was placed in the car with a number of law enforcement agents. Yes, at least two. He was made to lie on the floorboard of the car. Is this correct? I have no knowledge of that, sir. Okay, and he was transported to Hayes, Kansas. Correct. How far away is that? About 105 miles. Did you make that a matter of public record that he had been transported to Hayes to be kept during the proceedings? No, sir, I did not. And you didn't want to make it a public record, did you? No, sir. You wanted to keep his whereabouts unknown, didn't you? Correct. For security reasons? Correct. For his own safety? Yes, yes or no? I can't answer just totally yes or no. There were several reasons. Primarily for his own safety so he didn't get injured or shot or killed, Sheriff? Mr. Fooch, I object to the question being argumentative. The court overruled Mr. Springstead. Thank you, Your Honor. Sheriff, it's difficult for me, sir, to answer that in just a yes or no answer. Let me ask you this. You were concerned for his safety. Certainly. You were concerned that someone might make an attempt on his life. Correct. Originally I was, yes sir. Based on the hostility and the shock and the outrage in the community as to what had occurred out there? Correct. So he was moved away to Hayes, Kansas. And that wasn't the only place he was moved to, is it? No, it wasn't. So my client was moved several times. Correct, he was. No further questions, Your Honor. As many Kansans felt just like Melba Moore had, firmly believing these kinds of violent crimes only happen in the cities, investigators were quickly discovering that small-town America was precisely where the violence had began, with the robbery of a convenience store in the village of Kopmesh, Michigan, about 20 miles south of Traverse City. Michigan authorities were in full swing trying to obtain as much information as possible on the backgrounds of Mr. Walter, Ms. Dunn, and Mr. Rimetto all three born and raised in small town Michigan. When awoken to a 4 a.m. telephone call from a Michigan sheriff to tell him his son had been killed in a shootout with police in Kansas, Robert Walter, the 50-year-old father of Mark, was beside himself. He told the sheriff that he thought his son and some friends were traveling to Florida for vacation, as he was left to wonder how his child, 
who had lived a good Catholic life, an altar boy for ten years, could end up dead in this mess. We're just shocked out of her shoes to hear what happened, he later told a reporter from the Wichita Eagle. You raise the kid for 18 years and you try to bring him up right, and then all of a sudden he's gone. I don't know what else to say. Mr. Walter said his son had a few speeding tickets, but nothing serious, nothing like this. Sane, and I don't know who these other people are, and I don't know what they were doing out that way. He never mentioned he was going with anyone, he said, saying that he had never heard of Dunn, Remetta, or Hunter. I was expecting my son to return from Florida this week. We had no idea he was even heading towards Kansas. I'm completely dumbfounded. The mood was equally somber back in Grainfield, Kansas, where about 150 people had gathered for the funeral services of Larry McFarland. Larry's life touched the lives of many others in a positive way, said the Reverend James R. Bush. People could count on him. He was there when you needed him. But the Reverend also stated a sentiment that many of the frightened and angry Kansans who were burying their dead might have been taken aback by when he spoke these words over Larry's coffin. This crime was committed by troubled people who need our prayers. Their families need our prayers. It will not be easy. Meanwhile, as one of their own remained hospitalized in critical condition with a bleeding chest, the national law enforcement community was in full swing following the trail of blood through seven other states. Arkansas, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Florida, Georgia, all the way back to Michigan, where Mark Walter's father Robert was waiting for his son's body to be shipped back to be buried in a Catholic plot. I wonder what went wrong, he told the Wichita Eagle. We just don't know how he got involved in this. But I have to assume, if he was involved, he got what was coming to him. I'm Corey Zimmerman, and this is Spoon River Gothic, Season 2, Death Rides the Highway, a thrill ride fueled by murder and terror. Think, feel, and understand the world around you with Spoon River Gothic Podcast, because we go where the others don't. We dive deeper. And if you want to plunge even deeper into our true crime tales, please subscribe to Spoon River Gothic Agency. That's SRG Agency at www.patreon.com slash Spoon River Gothic Podcast. And access the Spoon River Gothic Podcast case file for bonus weekly episodes available on Spotify. And also included in the Patreon case file are investigative materials, such as exclusive audio interviews, trial footage, police files, court documents, photos, diagrams, and more to accompany each Season 2 episode of Death Rides the Highway. And if you like what you hear, please leave us a 5-star review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. It means more than you know in this cutthroat world. And until next time, work hard, party hard, keep a vigilant eye over your shoulder, and don't forget to watch each other's backs. This is a sideways world we are living in. And again, that's www.patreon.com slash Spoon River Gothic Podcast. Subscribe now, because there's always more to the story. Ever wonder how much of your personal data is out there on the internet for anyone to see? More than you think. Your name, contact info, social security number, home address, and even information about your family members is all being compiled by data brokers and sold to the highest bidders online. That means anyone on the web, criminal or investigator, can get your private details, which, as true crime enthusiasts know all too well, increases your risk of identity theft, phishing scams, harassment, stalking, and unwanted phone calls. As a podcast that exists publicly and shares our opinions online, we are hyper aware of safety and security, and all this data being so easily searchable on the internet can have real life consequences. This is why Spoon River Gothic is proud to partner with Delete Me, the number one service in online data removal. Delete Me finds and removes any information you don't want online and makes sure it stays off. 
Their dedicated team finds and removes your personal info from the largest people search databases and helps prevent potential ID theft, doxing, stalking, and phishing scams in the process. That's why I personally recommend Delete Me for protecting yourself and your personal information. Sign up at joindeleteme.com dash Spoon River and provide Delete Me with exactly what information you want deleted, and their experts will take it from there. As part of their subscription service, you will even receive personalized privacy reports showing what they found, where they found it, and what they removed. Delete Me isn't just a one-time service. Their experts are always working for you, constantly monitoring and removing the personal information you don't want accessible online. To put it simply, Delete Me does all the hard work of wiping you and your family's personal info off the web and making your personal profile no longer anyone's to sell. So join us at deleteme.com dash Spoon River because no one wants to be a victim nor a suspect. So get protected and the next time a case hits too close to home, you won't find yourself asking the stranger on the other end of the phone, how did you get my number? Go to joindeleteme.com dash Spoon River and get started today. Death rides the highway. <laughs> <laughs> 